I'll give over to Lewis now. Lewis is a leading member of the SWP and also one of the organizers of this event. So um, yeah, I'll give over to you, Lewis. Great, thank you, Lola. Um, look, I think that the point of this meeting is to have a discussion about how we can move forward, how we can go beyond solidarity with Palestine and how we can try and map out a strategy for liberation. Um, standing with Palestine at the moment is incredibly important. The pro-Palestinian movement across the world is under attack uh, from various different quarters. And we have to stand in solidarity with Palestine loudly and proudly. But what this session is about is it is about trying to map out what a strategy for Palestinian liberation can look like. Um, how do we use the feeling of support for Palestine, the feeling of solidarity, how can we turn that into a strategy for liberation? And I think to do that, we have to think about three things. I think there's three elements to mapping out a strategy for freedom for Palestine. The first thing we have to do is we have to know our enemy. We have to know what the Israeli state is. We have to know the politics of it. We have to know why it's an apartheid regime. We have to know the social fabric of it. We have to know why it oppresses Palestinians. The second thing I think we have to do is I think we have to know our friends. We have to identify who are the allies for the Palestinians. What are the forces that can stand with Palestine, yes, in solidarity, but can actually shift the balance in the region to build solidarity with Palestinian resistance? And the third thing I think we have to do is we have to recognize that the Palestinian struggle is a living and breathing thing. It's not about just applying formulas or phrases uh, just that you learn in meetings like this, as useful as these kind of meetings are. Um, it's about looking at the struggle in Palestine, looking at the agency of Palestinians and seeing that there can be shifts in the situation. And particularly, if you look over the last 10 years, one of the biggest shifts that has taken place is the uprising that happened in Palestine last year, in May last year. That has opened new horizons, I think for the question of Palestinian liberation. The actions taken by Palestinians uh, in the Palestinian state and in, in historic Palestine, what is known as Israel, that has shifted, I think, the balance in many ways in terms of what is happening in the region. So those are the three things I want to try and outline at this meeting. Um, the first thing then to start with is to look at the nature of our enemy and the nature of the Israeli state. And here, I think it's important to recognize that over the last couple years, we've seen an important development take place, which is that significant organizations have labeled Israel as an apartheid regime. So in the last few years, Amnesty International, one of the biggest uh, NGOs in the world, Human Rights Watch, one of the biggest human rights uh, organizations in the world, and B'Tselem, um, a Israeli human rights organization, all have come out and said that Israel is an apartheid state. This is quite a big deal. Um, Amnesty International's lawyers don't put anything out without checking it rigorously. They don't just throw words like apartheid around. They know that by publishing that report, uh, supporters of Israel and the Israeli state will throw everything at amnesty like they are now doing. So it's a big deal that they did this. And I think it's a result of the pressure from Israel's actions and from the movement in support of Palestine. So what does apartheid look like? What does apartheid look like uh, in 2022? Well, if you're a Palestinian in the West Bank, you live in, in settlements in areas of Palestinian land that are divided by military roads, by checkpoints, and by an apartheid wall. So your daily life is one of a constant struggle against Israeli soldiers. Um, sometimes violent, but 
always oppressive. Going to work, going to visit your family, going to the shops sometimes, you have to pass through various different checkpoints. If you live in East Jerusalem as a Palestinian, you face constant evictions and threats to be kicked off your land or your home. Um, famously, this happened in Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood which led to the big uprising that we saw in 2021, which was being evicted. Uh, that is a daily life if you live in East Jerusalem. Uh, if you live in Gaza, if you're one of the two million Palestinians who live in Gaza, you're living in one of the biggest, well, the world's biggest open air prison, where a siege by the Israeli military uh, checks everything that goes in and out. Food, water, medical supplies, all the rest of it. 60% uh, of Palestinians living in Gaza are dependent on international aid to survive, to live. Uh, that's the kind of apartheid that exists in Gaza. And if you're a Palestinian living in historic Palestine, what is called Israel, uh, if you live in Israel, you live in hemmed, or you're hemmed into overcrowded towns and cities, and you're subject to discriminatory, discriminatory laws around housing, around jobs, and all the rest of it. So that's what apartheid means today. But how did we get to this situation? What we need to try and do is we need to grasp the character of the Israeli state. Why is it like this? It's not just enough to say, you know, the Israeli regime is an evil regime. We have to understand the politics of it. We have to try and understand the history. And here, the central thing we have to grasp is that the Israeli state, since its foundation, has been tied to imperialist interests in the region. Imperialism is central to understanding the oppression of the Palestinians. And here what we have to understand is that after World War II, um, the Zionist leadership, those who were arguing for a Jewish-only state, they pulled off a spectacular coup. Because with their project of a Jewish-only state, they married that with the US, which was now the world's biggest superpower, they married those two interests, US interests in the region with the Zionist project. And what that meant is, is that US imperialism, which had seen anti-colonial uprisings after World War II in the region, in Morocco and Egypt and elsewhere, it needed a friendly regime to look after its interests. It needed a regime to oversee the interests of what was now the world's biggest superpower. And that's how really the Israeli state comes into founding in 1948. Um, if I look at the next slide, you don't need to take a quote from Socialist Worker or from a great Marxist theoretician to understand this. Look at what was being written in Israel at the time. Um, this is from Haaretz's newspaper. Uh, they wrote this in 1941 and they said this. Israel is to become the watchdog. There is no fear that Israel will undertake any aggressive policy, policy towards the Arab states when this would explicitly contradict the wishes of the US and Britain. However, if for any reason the Western powers should sometimes prefer to close their eyes, Israel could be relied upon to punish one or several neighboring states whose discourtesy to the West went beyond the bounds of the permissible. So this was recognized at the time. Uh, that this was the role that Israel was going to play. And for that state to be founded, um, for the new Israeli state to come into existence, it required the mass expulsion of the Palestinian population on the land. Uh, it required the mass expulsion of between 750,000 and 1 million Palestinians who had lived on that land for uh, a thousand years. Uh, and if people want to see more about that and know more, people should go to some of Elan Pape's meetings on Sunday at Marxism. Elan Pape has written lots of books on this, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which I'm sure bookmarks are selling downstairs. People should go to the panels on it on Sunday. Um, and to do that, they required the most brutal terror. Charlie, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, here is a quote from Moshe Dayan, who is a former Israeli chief of staff and a defense minister at the time, in the late 1940s and early 50s. Um, here he openly talks about the expulsion of Palestinians and the displacement of Palestinians. He says, Jewish villages were built in the place of Arab villages. 
You do not even know the names of these Arab villages because geography books no longer exist. <coughs> the Arab villages are not there either. There is not a single place built in this country that did not have a former Arab population. That's an open admission that every neighbourhood in it, what is now Israel at some point has been Sheikh Jarrah. At some point has faced eviction and expulsion. And it was with the most brutal force. Uh, people might have heard like massacres like the one at Deir Yassin, uh, where 107 villagers were taken out and shot and killed, women and children included, uh, to force uh, the Palestinians off the land. And so from its very foundation, Israel has been a state based on apartheid, on oppression, and on the dispossession of Palestinians. Now, what I want to look at now then, is what does that mean today? Because we have to do more than just apply what happened in 1948 and you know, the period afterwards to understand today. We have to try and understand the characteristics of Israeli society today in the 2020s. And here, I think that there are two important developments which see how the apartheid regime has uh, grown and expanded since that time. Um, the first thing to look at is that one of the big features of Israeli society, and especially the Israeli economy, is that it is one of the biggest recipients of US foreign aid uh, out of all the countries that the US pours foreign aid into. You can see this graph that from the 1970s onwards, there are huge spikes of uh, investment from, US, uh, from the US uh, foreign aid budget. Uh, a lot of this goes into uh, the military, the, uh, the military parts of the sector of the economy, the military sectors of the economy, uh, and the the state of this funding is such that from the 1990s onwards, there is something called memorandums of understandings that are signed in the U.S., which commit all U.S. governments, whether they're Democrat or Republican, to continue this high level of funding. That's how important it is. Uh, these mem MOUs, memorandums, memorandums of understanding, run beyond governments. They're not just about who's in power, they're, they're, they're seen as constant to guarantee this level of support. And what this level of support means is that the Israeli economy is one, a very militarized economy. Uh, the military sector is the dominant sector in Israel, uh, and therefore, you know, it has a qualit qualitative military edge over other countries in the region, but two, it's a very high-tech economy. Uh, it's a very advanced economy. Um, and what that means is, is that Palestinians are excluded from key sectors of the economy. Because they're seen as a security risk, because they're seen treated as second-class citizens, uh, the Palestinian working class in the region are excluded from the key sectors of the Israeli economy. So that's how one big way in which apartheid operates. It excludes the Palestinians from the most central parts of the economy. And what that means is, is that it is different, say, from apartheid South Africa. Um, apartheid South Africa was built off the back of the exploitation of the black population in South Africa. And therefore, the mass workers movements that you see in the 1970s and elsewhere have a huge impact in terms of rocking the South African economy. The same is not true in Israel. Uh, Palestinians do work in the economy, but because it's such a militarized and such a high-tech economy, they're excluded from some of the key parts of it. So that is how one way in which the apartheid regime has continued and developed. The second way, um, and this is the next slide, Charlie, is that... F Actually, sorry, it's not, if you go back. It, the second way it's continued is that ethnic cleansing has continued. Um, one of the features of Israeli society is that it preferences um, people of Jewish heritage to go and live there uh, above, say, Palestinians. So if you're a Palestinian who has, whose family were forced to flee in 1948, you're not allowed to return uh, to go and live in that land now. If you're a Jewish person who's got no correction, uh, connection to Israel, you are allowed to go. And what that means is that you see waves of new immigration into Israel. Um, in the 1950s, a lot of 
Jewish immigrants came from the Soviet bloc. Uh, in the 1960s, you saw quite a lot of Ethiopian Jews migrating. In the 1970s, there were lots of Jews from America. And in the 1980s and 1990s particularly, there was a huge wave of settlers from the old Soviet countries. Um, all, every wave of those settlers are tied ideologically, but also materially to the Zionist project because they need, you know, they require uh, new places to live, uh, new land to be settled, and new homes to be seized. <coughs> so this is how the Israeli apartheid regime has, you know, one way in which it's ma maintained itself, is that the new settlers arriving have an interest in Israel seizing Sheikh Jarrah, because they need that land. They have an interest in Israel encroaching on the small uh, Palestinian areas of land. And what that means, I think, is that Israel, throughout its existence, has been a unique settler colonial state. Um, it's continued that. It's not just something historic, it's something continuing today. One of the things that the Palestinians talk about uh, as the Nakba, which they refer to as the catastrophe in 1948, they talk about the Nakba as ongoing. It's not just a historic event. The Nakba is something which Palestinian people in the region have to face every day. So that is what I think we're up against. Um, that's the nature of the enemy that we face, and that's the nature of the apartheid regime. So what I want to come to now then is what does resistance look like to that? Faced with such a powerful, such a militarized, uh, a, 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 an enemy which is rooted in imperialism in the region, how is it that the Palestinians can win liberation? And the first thing I think we have to recognize here is that against all the odds, the Palestinian people continue to fight back. Uh, when the world's media has forgotten Palestine and moved on to the next story, the Palestinians remind us that they're still there. They remind us that apartheid is still taking place. And they do that by taking to the streets, uh, by rioting, by protesting, by going on strike, like we saw in 2021. And one of the things I think they've exposed in those struggles of the Palestinians themselves is I think they've exposed that the two-state solution is a sham. Um, the idea that Palestinian liberation is going to become through peace processes like the one at Oslo, I think has been uh, exposed as a sham. People might know the Oslo Accords in 1993 with Yishak Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister, alongside Yasser Arafat uh, on the White House lawn with Bill Clinton, was heralded as a new era for peace in the region. It was heralded as a historic settlement which was going to allow both countries to coexist. Um, what have we seen since 1993? What have we seen in that nearly 30 years? We've seen an acceleration of the dispossession of Palestinians. We've seen continued encroachment of Palestinian land. And we've seen an Israeli society moving more to the right and becoming more openly racist and uh, exclusionary towards Palestinians. Um, Edward Said, who's a great scholar and you know, people will have heard of, talked about Oslo as being an instrument of Palestinian surrender. Uh, not as being a settlement, not as a deal. It was an instrument of Palestinian surrender. It was used to uh, oppress the Palestinians, but with the blessing of, 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 of you know, Bill Clinton and, and, and the, the, the ruling class across the world. So this then raises the question, if the two-state solution um, doesn't work, if the legacy of the two-state solution is the smaller and smaller Palestinian uh, homeland becoming a reality, as, as this map shows, if that's what the two-state state solution has led to, what can a solution look like? Um, what kind of solution can bring a genuine just settlement uh, or a just solution in, in Palestine? And here, surely we have to say that any just solution in the region would allow Palestinian refugees the right to return home. Surely any kind of justice in the region would allow the nearly 7 million diaspora of Pal Palestinian refugees and their families and their descendants, surely they should be allowed to go and live on the land which they were expelled from. Surely that would be a solution in anyone's book. 
uh, that the people who were expelled and their families should be allowed to return home. Uh, if that was the case, it would bring into question the very fabric of Israel as a society. It would question what the 2018 um, nation state law said, which is that it is the exclusive right of Jewish citizens to settle in Israel. And therefore, rather than having a two-state solution, surely the democratic just solution would be one where Palestinians have the same rights as Israeli citizens. Uh, a state where there's a democratic state, where whoever lives there has the same rights. Now, that might sound like a bit of a fantasy, but in the last, what, five minutes that I've got, I want to try and map out what that means because and how we get there. Because, as I said, the struggle of the Palestinian people is heroic in many ways. Fighting against conditions that we can't imagine, uh, the Palestinians have the bravery to continue to fight back. Right? One thing that's clear, though, I think, is that they cannot win this struggle alone. Partly because of the nature of apartheid that I talked about with the Israeli economy, but also they're not going to win through military means. Uh, I defend the rights of all Palestinians to fight back in whatever means are available to them. But they are not alone going to uh, destroy uh, the Israeli state, an uh, armed military state with the support of US. Uh, what we have to look at, I think, is how we can topple the whole system of imperialism in the region. Because Israel's strength is that they are able to be backed by the US, but also that they rely on the regimes in the region and the ruling classes of the region who want to maintain the status quo. So that's true of al-Sisi in Egypt, the general who openly does big deals with Israel and is a big supporter, but it's true of the UAE as well, who give lip service to the Palestinians but sign big trade deals with Israel. This is what is able to maintain Israel's status in the region. And therefore, what force can be used to try and topple that state of affairs. And I think we have to try and look how the question of class comes into the Palestinian struggle. Because that can start with an analysis of the Palestinian working class. Um, I talked about the fact that they're excluded from some of the big sectors of the Israeli economy. But we have also seen glimpses that when general strikes and workers' activity has taken place, it has had quite a big impact as well. So if we look at the next slide, people will remember that there was a general strike called in May 2021. Activists at the time talked about how there was something different about this strike. There had been general strikes called before, but they were quite top down. Activists have written about how this strike was a bottom up mobilization. It led to huge demonstrations. It led to walkouts by quite big groups of workers. Now, of course, it was limited because of the features of the Israeli society that I went through. But one of the questions, therefore, that is raised by that is how can the Palestinian question fuse with wider class struggles in the region? How can the question of Palestinian liberation be linked and fused with the wider social struggles in the region, in Palestine, but also in the neighboring countries? Remember that in Jordan, a majority of the Jordanian population are Palestinian because they're refugees. In Lebanon, 200,000 Palestinians uh, live there. In Syria, it's 500,000. So the surrounding countries, the, the, Palestine, the, you know, the resistance of Palestine is something that is a huge part of working class movements. And therefore, how can we see how those two things confuse? And I think what we have to do, therefore, is look at this analysis about how class fits with it and think that, look, this is not something that is just plucked from the sky. If you look at the great social struggles of the region, particularly if you look uh, 11 years ago to that so-called Arab Spring, which took place, you saw that the question of Palestinian liberation could be married with the fight for social justice from working classes in countries around the region. So if you look at Egypt, the Egyptian revolution which took place, um, one of the key issues which knitted together a culture of protest in the years leading up to it was the question of Palestine. The activists who came out for Palestine in the lead up to the Egyptian revolution often went on to play quite a big role in mobilizing in the revolution more generally. If we look at the next slide, Charlie, you can see that in the Egyptian revolution, the Palestinian flags were often quite present. So Egyptians were fighting against their own ruling class for social justice questions around bread, 
uh, around the price of uh, wages, around the tax on living standards and all the rest of it. But the issue of Palestine was also raised. And what those revolts in 2011 did is they at least threatened or gave a glimpse of what it would look like if in the Middle East, rather than having regimes that were supportive of Israel and subservient to US interests, imagine if you had revolutionary states or radical states that put the question of Palestinian solidarity central. Imagine instead of having our Sisi, you had a revolutionary government which opened the Rafa crossing to let Palestinian refugees in, which took seriously the struggle against apartheid which openly argued against making deals with Israel. And imagine if the same had happened in the Syrian revolution, or the same had happened in Morocco, or the same in Jordan and elsewhere. Now, obviously, the question of why those revolutions failed is a whole other meeting, to be honest. Uh, there's a book on sale at Bookmarks which goes through it. People should read that instead of asking me to explain it in the last two minutes. But it's a crucial question, because what those rev revolts did is they raised what a revolutionary strategy for ending apartheid in Palestine would look like. And I think we have to think and hold that as a key uh, example of what we mean by marrying the question of the Palestinian liberation with the issue of class. And this is something, although it's 10 years ago, this is something that comes back today. Um, people might have heard of the journalist Ala Abd al Fattah, who is a political journalist, He's in one of Sisi's jails. He writes a wonderful account of about a year or a year ago when the May uprising took place in Palestine. From his prison cell in Sisi's jail, he said that every single political prisoner who were revolutionaries from 10 years ago were chanting for Palestine in May last year. And he writes about how they could smell the fear of Sisi's guards. They, were they knew they knew that the question of Palestine was a revolutionary issue. They knew that it brought back the feelings of 2011, obviously in a small way on that prison ward. But that gives a sense, I think, of the way in which Palestine can unlock much wider questions in the region. And what I'm going to finish on, Lola, with the two minutes I have left, is to say this. Look, what does this mean for us here in Britain? It really matters that we keep building Palestinian solidarity. People should go to the panel on Sunday with Loki and Ilan Pape to talk about the attacks on our movement, the way in which a real horror like anti-Semitism has been blurred with the question of anti-Zionism to try and silence uh, supporters of Palestine. Uh, we have to keep standing steadfast in our universities, in trade unions, in workplaces, in political organisations to keep flying the flag for Palestine. They want us to stop. We have to keep doing it. But also... We have to understand that Palestine is the key to unlocking the whole prism of imperialism in the region. And to do that and to unlock it, we do have to build that solidarity, but we have to try and map out a revolutionary strategy as well. And I'll leave it there. So if people want to put their hands up and then I'll call on you um, and then you can talk, ask your question for uh, up to three minutes. Yeah. So do you want to speak? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Miriam. I'm from the Newham branch of SWP. And I've been a Palestinian activist for quite a long time. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And I'm sure loads of people in this room have done many Palestine activities. And every time you go on the news, every single week, you just bloody just, and you just think, okay, they are fighting still, yeah. so we have to. Yeah. We don't risk anything, do we, really? Um, but what I want to say, my contribution is really about what Lewis said about the working class in the Middle East. I'm also a Middle East North Africa solidarity campaign, and there's a stall downstairs which I hope people will come to later. And as a result of that, I read and do quite a lot of work with the different uh, countries in the region, but especially with Sudan at the moment. Yesterday, I was at a demonstration outside the Sudanese embassy. Um, yesterday was the 30th anniversary of one of the things that happens in Sudan, which is, uh, you know, Bohan, the coup. Horrendous history, but the fight in Sudan is unbelievable. There's been a revolution, and I don't use the word lightly at all. The revolution has been going on there for three years since they got rid of... Um, El Bashir. And the bravery in the streets and the bravery in the workplaces has gone on since then. There are 5,000 resistance committees in Sudan at the moment. 
the momentum is all from the bottom up. They've learned about the middle class. The middle class did help get rid of Bashir. There's no doubt about that. You know, the freedom of forces of change did a great job. But actually, the revolution to be continued has gone to the bottom. The people right at the bottom, resistance committees, are very, very brave, very young, and very organized. And they were on the streets in their tens of thousands yesterday, knowing there would be casualties. There were. We think there were nine deaths. And I know this is going to sound callous. Given the level of struggle there, nine deaths is not that great. It was a, the military is in power. The military. But what I need to back back to the meeting. Right. Every every time the working class moves, the masses move, the street moves, because there's a lot of informal work, obviously, in the Middle East, you don't have to tell them to support Palestine. Palestinian flags are already there. Palestinians at their heart. It's not just what I said at the beginning. We feel if they can fight, we can fight. Everyone in the Middle East takes that inspiration far greater and far deeper and far longer than us. Oh, yes, I'll try and I, yes, I will go. So when they fight in the Middle East, Palestinian is the liberation. When we say here, in our thousands, in our millions, we are Palestinians, they feel it there, they know it there, and they use that as their inspiration to link. Well, another thing Lewis said is about um, in the prison with Abdel al Fattah. So people might be very depressed when they look at, there are probably, there's a generation of activists in Egyptian prisons at the moment, so you're depressed. But Palestinian struggle brings together all the elements. People, the Muslim Brotherhood and the left in Egypt, blood, blood has been shed between them, but Palestine unites them. Think about the sectarianism we sometimes face. It's minimal. We haven't had bloodshed. But Palestinian unites people all across the Middle East in their fight against their oppressor, their own government. They identify with the Palestinians with their own struggle all the time. If you look across the Middle East, the Palestinian flags are always there. And I would just urge you, follow the fight in Sudan. This, I, th I think this is going to sound very bad, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I said it at the, um, I was the only white person outside the Sudanese embassy last night, and they're so fed up with no one taking any notice of them. I said, well, you've made the mistake of being African, being black, being Muslim, triple whammy, but the reason the, the media are ignoring you is because you're fighting. You're fighting the powers that be, you're fighting the establishment, you're fighting, the, and every time you do that, you're fighting US, UK, EU, and... Um, uh, two quick things. Um, when you said about the importance of understanding anti-Zionism being different from anti-Semitism, and a lot, especially uh, the big media, tends to think they're the same. Um, I think it would be a recommendation for everyone. Um, I, I come from a, a Jewish family, and we've always talked about Palestinian struggle. Um, and there is a, an important uh, Instagram page called Jewish Voice for Peace, and they're very big supporters of the Palestinian struggle. So it's very important to share with other people that, you know, um, Jewish, not all Jewish people are against Palestine. Um, it's really important to, to show that there are Jewish people who are extremely in favor of the of Palestine and that there are Jewish anti-Zionists. Um, second thing, when you talk about, about imperialism and how uh, is the, the state of Israel helps imperialism in the region, I, I, I think it obviously goes beyond that, um, especially when we look at uh, after the US being the major uh, purchaser of military intelligence of Israel when it, when it comes to training their own military, their own police, we have to think that the, the, sec the other two main are India, uh, they buy so much military intelligence from Israel uh, to oppress uh, Muslim, the mu Muslim population in India. And the third is Brazil, which um, has the second biggest uh, incarcerated population in the world of the vast majority of black people. And the military police in Brazil, they use the intelligence of Israel to uh, oppress the population of Brazil, the working class population of Brazil, and they benefit from the state of Israel uh, just as much as the US and obviously Israel itself. I think we can all take inspiration from Nick Lynch, who's the union boss leading the RNT strike, because he's against the super rich and against exploitation of the workers, whom the majority of us in this country and in the North of Ireland, where I come from, 
are being oppressed and exploited. And that will lead to and will give um, courage, well not that the Palestinians need any courage, but maybe encourage more people in this country to support Palestine that don't already support it. So I say mass strikes by everybody against the super rich, the one percent all over that are responsible for imperialism. Uh, I think in this country it's difficult to understand perhaps what we can do and it's difficult to see if we can make an impact. But well, I think it's important that we look at the BDS movement. I think it's important that we look at the shutdown Albert movement. So I've been to a few of the um, I've been to, uh, the Albert factory in Shenston, and the protest they have there is incredible. It's it's not a nice place to be. They're, they're filming. They've got the cameras up in their face, but it, it is making a difference. It's not going to it's not going to destabilise Israel. It's not going to give them erasure. But I think it is a more concrete example of what we can actually do for the Palestinian people. Uh, Elbit, um, Israel gets almost 90% of its drones from Elbit. So it, we can make that difference. We can make life better for ordinary Palestinians. We can, in a very insignificant way, we can help. We can do something that will make a difference for Palestinian people. Uh, yeah. Um, just picking up on some of the discussion, I remember when I joined the Socialist Workers' Party, I'd always supported Palestine, but I learned two very important things. The first, as, as the comrade over there says, is that the, the people in the SWP who put the clearest arguments were Jewish socialists, Tony Cliff in particular, and, and John Rhodes, two of the leading writers on, on, on this topic, who demonstrated that within Jewish population, there was a layer of people prepared to put a hard argument against Zionism. The second thing I learned was central to their argument was a slogan that, that has rung true for many decades, but is increasingly clear, which is the argument that the road to Jerusalem passes through Cairo. In other words, if you look at the state of the, of the Palestinian struggle, it is implausible that the Palestinian people will win a victory for a militarized struggle against the Israeli state, Therefore, victory for the Palestinians relies on a broader struggle among the Arab masses, which will also have to settle scores with the regimes in, in Egypt, in Sudan, and in the, in the other countries in, in, in the region. I think that's a crucial argument for two reasons. First of all, if you look at the trajectory of the Palestinian leadership, the official Palestinian leadership, if you look at the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Fatah, the organization that, that leads it, Historically, this was an organization that modeled itself on Arab nationalist regimes around the region, which are regimes which increasingly came to terms with American imperialism. There is no sense in which the, in which the Egyptian regime, in real terms, wants to support the Palestinian masses in upsetting the imperialist order in the region from which it benefits. And in, in other words, we can't look to these kind of nationalist forces whose vision is to, is to create a state uh, in, in the region, modern Egypt, Tunisia, Sudan, and so on. We have to look to a broader struggle linking Palestinian workers and the Palestinian oppressed with the Arab oppressed uh, and exploited workers more, more, more generally. Um, and the second reason why it's so important is that historical argument we put is far more credible today. It's credible for the reasons uh, Miriam and other people who've spoken have talked about. If you look across the region, what you see is the, you know, the chimes of freedom flashing. You see the Egyptian revolution in 2011. You see the events in Sudan uh, at the moment, and you see the real possibility of a broader revolutionary process that upsets the whole imperialist order in the region, in Egypt, in Sudan, in Tunisia, in Syria, and so on, which can ultimately link up with a struggle in Palestine and pave the way for genuine, real liberation in the region. Um, yeah, I've got a, a question that um, kind of about when I was listening to the information um, at the beginning about uh, the dispossessed Palestinians that are living in the region all around Palestine, you know, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, <laughs> etc., many, many more. And that you were saying that we've got to um, consider, you know, uh, 
not trying to work at the top because that's too difficult or is working with the, the bottom options. And I was thinking that in each of these regions, within those working class uh, neighbourhoods, the Palestinians are treated differently anyway, aren't they? I mean, they're treated badly in, in Egypt, they're treated badly in, in all the countries that they live in, in Lebanon, um, they're not given access to jobs. I'm sure that the ordinary people in fighting for jobs and housing turn against the Palestinians. And I'm wondering if that's orchestrated. It's only you made me think would that also be orchestrated by those that I cannot mention at the top that pull all the strings? Would that be a way of getting the powers all to work together and blaming everything on the Palestinians in Lebanon, in Syria, in wherever it might be? Thank you. Mm. Um, hands. I just want to make a quick thing about contributions. You don't have to say a lot, you can just ask a question or it doesn't matter what level of knowledge you have. Yeah. Um, what, what hands were up, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to come back on the uh, comrade over here who you thought really well about doing activity in, in support of uh, BDS. And I don't think it is insignificant. I think the, the thing with um, the thing with uh, doing these activities is that it's what the Israeli government uh, it affects them. They don't want it. They don't want us to be out in the streets. I live in a, in a small town in South Wales um, and uh, we go out once a month and we leaflet the town. Uh, we, we have film shows. Uh, we have you know, all sorts of things going on there for our PSC group. And it's been really brilliant because you know, we are, we're, you know, you just keep things going in terms of um, keeping the issue alive, talking to people. It's really interesting. You get a lot of support on the streets as well. We should be more confident about this issue. You do get, well, you do get occasionally, you do get uh, people who are pretty hostile. Get attacked. Um, but, you know, you get a lot of support. And I think really, for me, the key point here is that um, if yeah, anti-imperialism is a crucial aspect of being a working class militant, and therefore, if we raise this issue, which is one of the key issues of anti-imperialism, in the world today. If we raise that through in, within our communities, within our trade unions and so on, we're raising a massively important anti-imperialist struggle for us, you know, not as well as for the Palestinians. I'm not just saying it's just important for us, but obviously it's very, very important for the Palestinians. And knowing that people are out there fighting for Palestinian rights in every community in Britain is very, very important. And I just think it's, it, you know, so the, the thing I'm really saying is, it's not insignificant, by the way, when you go out and do those things. It's really significant. It's a thorn in the side of the Israeli government, and they hate us for it. And that's a good reason to do it. I just wanted to add that before we talking about the, the earlier, like, it's, it's important to remember that by addressing something like an uh, imperialism in Israel, uh, you also talk about a, a wider uh, sense of imperialism, not only across America, who gives so much funding to Israel, but uh, the UK as well, and all other forms of imperialism that we see across the world. So resistance is sort of united and unanimous in that way. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to make a short contribution about what we can, what, what, what we bring as Marxists to analysis of imperialism. I mean, it's already been sort of illustrated by the by the brilliant introduction by by some of the contributions by comrades. Um, but I'm guessing that everyone here at Marxism Festival is interested in sort of a Marxist analysis of look. And I think the key that people have been putting across is this idea that Palestine has always been a class struggle. Um, yes, it's a national struggle against against a particularly horrible. Um, oppression, but it's also always been completely tied to patterns of, of class development and, 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 and to a class struggle in Palestine. The, the, the Palestinian resistance, the reason it's been so fiery over so many, many, many years, is because it's always been carried um, by the layers of, of the Palestinian urban masses, whether it was in the refugee camps of, of Lebanon and Syria and Jordan, whether it was in the Intifada, um, the, 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 the masses of people living in the West Bank. Um, or, the, or the general strike in 2021. 
Um, and it's that reason that it's got that power um, to inspire people across across the region as well. Is because it's not just an incredible show of resistance. It's a incredible show of resistance who, by people who are living in terrible working conditions, in terrible living conditions. People see a mirror of their own struggles as working class people, whether you're in Egypt, in Jordan, but it's, it's harder for us here to see how our, how our condition is linked to that. But actually, I think people see this incredible um, um, link in, in, in one minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and also in, in the kinds of resistance that that, that, that that then inspires, we can take resistance from that. Um, so if you're a teacher in the room, have a read and look into what the, what the teachers in Palestine organised during the first intifada, when they organised their own um, education programs to combat the, the, the Israeli education programs and said, we, we want to educate for our own um, resistance. Um, just to finish, on, on, on a different point, what can we do here? Because that's what also our, our, our analysis as Marxist gives us, is the idea to say, where, where do we have power? It's here as, as actually as workers and as students. Um, so the, the PSC, well, the, the, the fantastic campaign of Elbit, I think it was successful because it managed to draw in so many people around the community um, yeah, and the trade union movements who could back up this incredible um, campaign. So if you're in a trade union, if you're in a university, what can you do to try and link those struggles together? Um, it, yeah. yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, just following on from that, if you followed the class argument, the question I've got to ask is, does Israel have a working class that aren't Palestinian? And if so, what they're doing? And I want to link that to the fact that you said it's a highly militarized society. And in most of the other revolutions we're seeing, it's the young people that are the activists on the street. And yet in Israel, it's compulsory military service. So you're brought into that uh, system, you know, the ruling ideas and things, and it's harder to question that. And I would like to make that link to the recent assassination of the uh, journalist, because it's about Israelis getting the, uh, the truth and the picture of what's happening. So I'd quite like a sort of comment on that, because if we're following that argument, we should be saying there's sections, even if they're very small, of the Israeli working class who should be on the side of the Palestinians. And as you've said, you know, there are um, human rights organizations that are coming up and agreeing that it's apartheid. So if you've got any information on that, I think it would be useful. Thank you. There's a point I'd like to make, maybe it's a little bit superficial, but the problem in Britain, I think, is the mainstream media. And you have no idea, I don't think, because here we're absolutely sympathetic with the Palestinian situation, but it doesn't reach the, the voices of the base of the British people, I'm afraid. The PR that has been generated in Ukraine is staggering, absolutely staggering, to the point now that no one is even considering that there might have been another option to this bloodbath that is going on. And somehow the selection of the press with its pretty dog here and its dog here and a dog here and a little child there, the whole country is focused on this. But where is the picture that touches the heart of the British people? It's not there. When you see a building going down, do you see a little child standing there crying? No, unfortunately you don't. You see a wailing man or a kid with stones. It's so, it's so done so cleverly to come out to somehow to give into the Western mind or to the British mind that this is not quite us. Now, of course, among all of us here, we know that's not true. But you look at the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph and the Sun. Those are the people, sadly, that go off and vote. You know, there is a picture I have in my mind. I saw it in Yachtachim. There's a little boy of around four. He's holding up his arm to show that he has been branded. A little Jewish boy. He's trying really hard to look brave. It's always been in my mind. Two years ago, I was in Hebron, and I saw another little boy walking through one of those checkpoints, which are not checkpoints, they're laboratories, as you well know. And he was holding the hand of his little sister, and he too was trying to look brave. Where is a picture of that little boy? 
shares the same horror, the same degradation of his family, the same loss of his culture, in which the only soldiers he ever sees are those that have guns at him or guns at his family. This is our tragedy. The mainstream media is supine, as, as Jeremy Corbyn has so rightly said in his latest classified interviews. There is something desperately wrong in our society that we cannot have another voice, either from this government or the thing that calls itself an opposition or anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas there? To link to what the comrade just before me said, like if it is an issue with the media, but if like to combat that, if enough people were educated on what's actually going on, then it could be possible for enough pressure to be put on to cut Israel off from some of their support, which is another big way that we could actually do something tangible from over here or from America. Like it's not it's not just a case of what can be done over there and how can we help them. There are tangible ways that we can help here. And one of those is like trying to cut them off, trying to cut Israel off from the huge amounts of support that the West gives. I mean, you know, it's often portrayed as a religion, and it's not about anti Semitism. It's about anti Zionism. And I think the way we can really see that is if you look at how is sorry, I'm not speaking loud, I'm too loud, um, is, um, you know, if we look at how Israel treats its Somalian Jews. In Israel, yeah, you know, these are people who are treated the Jewish people. So if they're of the same religion, should have a right to be of equal citizens in Israel, but actually are not equal citizens in Israel. Are treated as second-class citizens. Are treated absolutely with appalling racism. So you can see, this is not about Semitism. This is not about Judaism. This is actually about a political belief of of Zionism. And I think, and somebody asked a question about the working class in Israel. Well, I think what has been different when we talk here about working class not benefiting from racism, the working class in Israel directly benefits from the discrimination of the Palestinian people, and that's what makes that working class a different discussion and a different argument when we talk about them. Which is why we look to the Arab work in Egypt and in the surrounding countries for support rather than looking to the Israeli working class. That isn't to say that there isn't some resistance within Jewish people within Israel, and there is, and some very, very brave people who refuse to join the army, who refuse to, um, you know, to protest against the settlements and that. Um, but it is a minority of people, and it isn't the same as looking to the working class as we might do here when we're thinking about racism. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say one other point about uh, the foundation of the state of Israel and the maintenance of the state of Israel around the world has been primarily by people who are themselves actually racist. Um, you think about President Nixon, you think about the people who fought for recognition of Zionism as a political current in Britain. And remember, Britain's at the centre of all this because it was Britain that actually behind the, the partition in the first place. And the second thing that I want to say is about um, the foundation of the state of Israel has always been from the outset of a greater Israeli project. And if you look at all the so-called peace processes that have taken place, at the end of every single one of them, what's happened is there's been a greater Israel and a smaller Palestine. So the, the reason that we're having this discussion now, I think, is because actually the path to reform has systematically been closed down by the imperialist states because they see Israel as supporting their interests. And I think that therefore the point is, is that the argument about revolution that we're having here is an argument that has a much greater currency amongst not just Palestinians, but also among uh, all, all the countries that Maria mentioned earlier and the revolutions that are taking place now. These links are being made by people because they can understand that the, 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 the fight against the Israeli state is a fight against imperialism. And those that fight for the state of Israel are, are actually saying that it's never possible to challenge anti-Semitism. 
whereas our organisation had been founded on the, on absolutely from the beginning on a fundamental recognition that if you do not recognise the need to fight and to, to, to fight anti-Semitism as a fight against racism, then you cannot fight uh, the, the state of Israel effectively and fight for genuine anti-racism and against imperialism. Um, I think that we, we do call um, we call Israel um, an apartheid state, and just like apartheid states in Rhodesia and in South Africa, the working class, the white working class, and the black working class are worlds apart. They they have no class solidarity because they are treated completely differently. But I, I don't understand how I don't know how um, how well this transfers over to Israel, but. I think that there are definitely elements of this um, within the Israeli working class. I think that they are very separate from the Palestinian working class. They have no class solidarity with each other, and that's why we can't necessarily, oh, can't necessarily trust the Israeli working class on their own to fight for Palestinian liberation because they have no class solidarity. Good reason. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow on that point, I think, yeah, you're right, uh, especially when you mentioned South Africa, there was absolutely no solidarity or parallels even between the two, which was why, in terms of South Africa, you saw the solidarity with working class from the rest of the world. Like, for example, in Ireland, you had cashiers who refused to process uh, fruit and veg that was from South Africa. So it's the same thing that was being mentioned, that it is now up to us as the working class from the rest of the world who do see the similarities, especially in the Arab world. Now, obviously, I feel not that our contributions and solidarity are not equal, but it does strike me that any time you know, we're on a picket line or we're on a protest, we're not staring down the barrels of guns. We're not being shot at. Any time one of us falls, they don't come to the funeral where we celebrate our comrades and then beat us until we drop the coffin. So, yeah, it's just a matter of... Obviously, we have to have solidarity, but just to think about, you know, anytime we complain about, you know, there's a picket line and, you know, the police are there, it's like, it doesn't even come close to what our, you know, brothers and sisters on the other side of the world are facing. I just want to steal the for a second and um, maybe ask a bit of a question because we often make these parallels between the uh, of Africa and. Um, the state of Israel. But I often think that the situation in South Africa and the way that de Klerk gave over the presidency to the ANC is a perfect example of the importance of a revolutionary process. If you think about it, we almost saw a revolution happen in South Africa. A lot of people thought there was going to be a revolution in South Africa in the 90s. And that was actually halted by the state sanctioned solution, by the fact that you know, a lot of Afrikaans people, a lot of racist people in control of the state in South Africa knew that there was going to be a revolution and to save themselves, they had to give over, they had to nuclear disarm South Africa and then give it over to the ANC. And actually South Africa is in still a grave mess, do you know what I mean? It's highly impoverished and actually still highly segregated in a lot of ways because that wealth was never redistributed and that privilege was never given back. And I wonder if people think that there's something to be said about that in Palestine and Israel as well, or in Palestine, um, if, if that kind of revolutionary <coughs> process is similar, and if we actually do see this sort of two-state solution thing, this big UN sanction, this big America sanctioned, um, you know, greeting of the two of the two peoples, will we have a, the same problem? Because there will never be that leveling of people on a, on an equal basis, and, and you know, the privilege will not be evened out. I'm just curious, but sorry, I'm rambling now. <laughs> Does anyone else want to um, Yeah, as you said, kind of like we, like in South Africa, there could have been a potential socialist uprising around the time of the end of apartheid, but in order to kind of harm reduction, um, a lot of liberal states and governments wanted to reduce the um, momentum that that movement had. And progress is being made in Palestine. Progress is solid, steady, and it will not end with the suppression of the Palestinian people. It will end in victory. The Palestinian liberation yeah. and we need to keep in mind that when that victory comes we can't let it be diluted by ideas of oh we need to maintain some some of the status quo or the kind of dilution that the two-state solution offers 
uh, you have to let the victory be uh, one that's true to your morals and your virtues, and not one that's a compromise with the oppressor. contributions that people want to make. You can feel free to just even ask one question or um, move back to something. We've got a bit of time left. Is everyone sure? Speak now or forever, hold your peace. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, name's Graham Tate. Um, we can't ignore the Palestinian struggle uh, because it directly affects us here. It's, um, I believe, and I've got evidence to prove it, that the uh, IHRA definition uh, comes out of Mossad. Uh, I mean, there was a meeting held in, uh, you're nodding your head, you know about it, uh, in 2004. And there's a group of people who, uh, any, anyway, so that, that's where it came from. Um, uh, uh, Ken Stern uh, credits Dinah Porat uh, as the person who came up with the idea of, let's invent this uh, um, uh, definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, Diane Porat works uh, for a think tank. Uh, and, and who found this think tank? Uh, Deputy Director of Mossad. So if, if ever you're talking about the IHRA definition, I've just been speaking to a comrade over here who comes from Austria and said they have a lot of problems with this. And I'm sure everybody does. And a whole of, of the, the EU and in America, America uh, uh, universities and things will, 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 will take the IHRA definition. So it's a Mossad definition. They, they defined it because it conflates uh, the, 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 the two. It conflates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. What effect has it had here? We can't ignore it here because they, they ran a four-year smear campaign against Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, I, I'm talking about a secret service operation which has been run for 17 years, because it's started in 2004. It had a period of four years of a smear campaign against Jeremy Corbyn. It cost him, it cost him uh, the 2017 election. They came very, very close. So everybody in Britain has been affected by it, by what is a secret service operation. I know that to my cost. I guess it's very difficult to, for me to talk about this, because I was in in uh, Japan. Yeah, yeah. I was in Japan and I was trying to say what I've been saying to all of you. Hey, hey look, it's, it's a smear campaign. I was uh, arrested by the Japanese police and I was thrown into the... That's the trouble when if you cross Mossad and the CIA, it's, it's, it's dangerous. I, I won't go into what, what's, what was going on there, but yes. Yeah. I've already spoken, but so it's anybody else. I'm just going to come back on this thing about the, the Israeli working class thing, because it, I think it, there is a, a problem. And I think the problem is that I think the Israeli working class would benefit from a democratic secular state in Palestine. I don't think they benefit from Israel from being in benefit from Israel. They might think they're a bit, they benefit from that, but I don't think they do. Uh, I'm not arguing that the Israeli working class is a revolutionary class. It's going to go to revolution. But I do think there is a problem if you write off the idea that a, a democratic secular state in Palestine would actually be to the benefit of Israeli workers. And Israeli workers actually are not safe in Israel. They're not in a place where they're not in a good place you know, for being for being Jewish. It's not a, it's not a safe place for Jews. And therefore, we have to, I think, argue a little bit more um, subtly than that, that, than to say that they benefit from from um, Israeli apartheid. They might think they benefit. It might look like they benefit, but I do think, and I don't think they're going to be the agency for change, but I do think that we should argue uh, a bit more subtly. Otherwise, we can it can tip over into the idea of what do we do with the Jewish workers in, in Palestine. And I'd say that Jewish workers in Palestine have every right to be there and um, uh, can, you know, if a revolutionary upheaval in the Middle East place they can they we would like them to be part of that and I'll give for for them to support it
last person with their hand up. Um, just before we go back to Lewis to sum up, um, I'm just going to talk about um, the bookmark stall because we have a lot of books here on Palestine. We obviously have our pamphlet, but we also have some of Ilan Pape's books, his book with Noam Chomsky, um, and also the oh, Ethnic Tensing of Palestine, which are all available at the bookmark stall, as well as the book um, Lewis, oops, sorry, Lewis, Hi. Lewis mentioned um, in his opening part, Anne Alexander's book on, um, this, this is the one he mentioned with um, the Egypt Spring, but the Arab Spring, sorry, um, Crisis and Revolt in the Middle East. And North Africa Revolution is the Choice of the People, which I think was, is actually fresh off the press um, and also will be down at the bookmark stall. But I will now give back to Lewis to uh, sum up and respond to your questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Lola. And thanks for everyone for all the questions and comments. I thought it was a very interesting discussion. And there are obviously more sessions about Palestine over the weekend, which people can go to. I just want to come back on a couple of the points that were raised, starting with the question of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. The first thing we have to say is that anti-Semitism is a very real threat in the world today. Anti-Semitism is a terrible, destructive form of racism, and we have to oppose it as actively and as vigorously as we can. Uh, but we have to say that the threat of anti-Semitism does not come from the Palestine Solidarity Movement. The biggest threat from anti-Semitism today is from the far right. If you look around Europe, if you look in America, if you think about Charlottesville where they were chanting Jews will not replace us, if you think about the Euro-fascist projects like the one in Hungary of, uh, you know, Jobbik and, and the populist movements like Viktor Orban in Fidesz, they often talk of George Soros, they often use openly anti-Semitic language and they have contributed to a rise in anti-Semitism in some places like that. So anti-Semitism is real. It doesn't help when some people on the left say that anti-Semitism is manufactured by the people who try to conflate it with anti-Zionism. It's not manufactured, it's real and we have to oppose it. At the same time, we have to recognise that anti-Semitism is not the same thing as anti-Zionism. Zionism is a political ideology. If you go back to the foundations of the early Zionist movement at the end of the 19th century and then into the 20th century, it was a political ideology, but only one strand of a political ideology. It was a political ideology that some Jewish people subscribed to, but there were lots of Jews at the time who didn't subscribe to Zionism. Famously, in places like Poland, there were socialist Jewish groups like the Jewish Bund, who led the resistance to the Nazis in, uh, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that took place in 1943. What shifted things is that the Zionist project, like I talked about, pulled off a spectacular coup where it got US imperialist backing for its project of a Jewish-only state. That's what made it a much bigger um, force in terms of being able to put itself forward, put itself forward as, the spoke, you know, as the spokespeople for all Jewish people across the world. But we should also recognize that the Americans and the British didn't do this out of a feeling of sympathy with the Jewish people who had obviously just suffered the horrors of the Holocaust. We should remember that it was common knowledge what was happening in the concentration camps and that the Allied forces did nothing to bomb the tracks leading to the concentration camps or to bomb the concentration camps themselves. And they also did nothing to let in the Jewish refugees who were fleeing it. The record, especially of America in Britain, during the Second World War, is one where they shut their doors to Jewish refugees fleeing the horrors of Nazi Germany. And why did they do that? There were various factors, but we know that there is a strand of anti-Semitism within the British ruling class. Famously, Winston Churchill, the great national hero who Tariq Ali will be speak uh, speaking about tomorrow, famously was an anti-Semite and has been quoted saying the most horrible things about Jewish people. So we have to be clear what is Zionism or what is why we're against Zionism and why that's not the same as anti-Semitism. And what that means today is that it is possible, because they're different things, it is possible to be a Zionist and to be an anti-Semite. Look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump was what the, one of Israel's best friends. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. 
John, Donald Trump frequently at his campaign rallies would put a picture of George Soros or Janet Yellen, who uh, I don't know if she still does, used to run the, the Fed, uh, and basically put up anti-Semitic imagery. Uh, look at Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, is a virulent anti-Semite. He's invited by the Israeli government to their official event as a friend of Israel, uh, as a friend because the new narrative is that anti-Semitism comes from Muslims and it comes from the left. And so therefore, Viktor Orban is accepted as a friend of the Israeli regime. What a horrible state of affairs. Someone, to be honest though, but someone who honestly flirts with uh, far-right elements who are openly uh, you know, claiming the legacy of those who collaborated with the Nazis is seen as a friend of the Israeli regime in, in, in 2022. What does that mean here? People talked about it, but the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn clearly were used to try and silence the Palestinian movement in Britain. Why did they go for Jeremy Corbyn? Um, obviously, he represented the hopes of millions of people in terms of wanting change around questions of housing, of education, of an end to poverty, of refugees welcome. But crucially, he represented the anti-imperialist movement here in Britain. And that's what scared the British ruling class the most. The question of imperialism is central. They wanted to silence Corbyn, but they wanted to silence the pro-Palestine movement. How do we know that? What is, the one, what is the, one of the biggest things that Keir Starmer is leading the offensive on now? It's on the question of NATO. Uh, you're not allowed to question NATO, really, if you're a Labour Party member. Uh, the MPs aren't even allowed to question it. So they were rocked by Corbynism and the support for a general change in the world, but particularly the question of anti-imperialism was central. In all of this, though, I want to say something about terminology. You see, I don't think it's helpful to talk of a Zionist lobby or an Israeli lobby. The reason I don't think that's helpful is it suggests that there's shadowy forces undetected, behind the scenes, who are pulling the strings. I, can, I think that can veer into anti-Semitic language. The support for Israel from the British ruling class is not done secretly. It's out in the open. They don't need to do it secretly. There's not a secret lobby of, you know, what, I don't know, people then start using terminology like Rothschilds and the rest of it. That's not how it works. The British ruling class from the foundation of Israel has always been a big supporter, openly, and so have the US. That's how we should attack it. And it works both ways. It's not, you know, it's not the Israelis lobbying Britain and trying to control the policy. It works both ways. Britain supports what Israel does, and Israel has support for British interests in the Middle East. And I think that's a really important thing for us to point out. And it's important to mention that it's true of conservative parties, but it's also true of the Labour Party as well. It's also true of the Labour Party. Look, historically, the Labour Party has always had illusions in the idea that you can get a socialist Israel or that Israel could play a progressive force in the region. Uh, and that, I think, is a big, big mistake. The next point I just wanted to raise, and which leads on to it, is the question of the Israeli working class, which people mentioned. Can the Israeli left play a solution in Palestine, uh, play, sorry, can the Israeli left play a role in a just solution for Palestine? That's a very important question. I think it's right to start by saying that there are some brave people in Israel who, spe who speak out. Uh, Bet Salem, the human rights organization, it's brave of them to say that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, they will be getting a lot of backlash about that in Israeli society. However, none of those people have the social forces to try and change things in Israel. And the reason is this. The Israeli working class is complicit in the set of colonialism of the Israeli state. If you go back to the early days of the foundation of Israel in 1948, uh, the Histrajat, which was the biggest trade union, uh, it operated a policy of excluding the Arab working class and excluding Arab workers. The Hishida, the Israeli trade unions, used to go around smashing up Arab stalls, Arab shops, burning them on fire. Uh, they excluded the Palestinians. So the Hishida, the trade unionists, were actively enforcing settler colonialism. Uh, they, at no point did they put forward the idea, 
as you know, some some uh, unions did in America when when uh, segregation was happening. At no point did anyone did the history or any uh, working class organisation in Israel put forward the idea that you could unite uh, Palestinian and Israeli working class people together in one union or in or in common fights. And what that means today is what I talked about in my introduction is that the waves of immigration into Israel who, you know, workers in the Israeli economy, they have, yes, an ideological uh, interest in, in Zionism, but they have a material one as well. They have a material interest in seizing Palestinian land, in excluding Palestinian workers, and in maintaining the apartheid regime. And therefore, I think we have to say that the Israeli left cannot be part of the solution. There are brave people, and I'm sure that, you know, if, if, if a revolt of its size happens, that they will, you know, be able to play some sort of role. But the social force does not exist in Israel to turn it into a democratic state. The social force is the Palestinian working class and the working classes of the region. And if you want an, uh, an illustration of this, you can look at the fact that any illusion in the idea of a left in Israel or a socialist Israel is now gone. Uh, but in the 50s, there used to be the kibbutz, and earlier. There used to at least be illusions in the idea that there were socialists and, you know, who were doing communal things in Israel, uh, and, you know, that there was a left. That left is now tiny, if, if not, if, it's, if it even exists at all. The locum of Israeli politics is now completely to the right. Uh, it is now, as you see with you know, people like Netanyahu, uh, you see that the Israeli government's actually fallen in the last couple of days. The whole locum of Israeli politics has moved to the right. So what does that mean then for the solutions that we talked about? I think it's right what people have said, that one of the biggest reasons why we need a more radical solution is that the strategies put forward by the nationalist forces in Palestine or the Arab nationalist forces have failed. It, people talked about Fatah, who run the Palestinian Authority. Um, the Palestinian Authority really polices the Palestinian population on behalf of Israel. Um, they do not offer any form of resistance. And this is not because they're just sellouts or, you know, bad politicians. Their whole vision of Palestinian liberation is an incredibly limited one. Fatah and those kind of forces see themselves as getting a slice of the pie within the current imperialist framework. They see themselves as getting a sort of, you know, piece of it, and they'll be happy with that. And Israel can continue, uh, Sisi and Egypt can continue. They want to find a place for themselves in that pyramid. Our vision is something completely different. We want to tear the whole pyramid down. We want to upset the whole prism of imperialism in the region. And in the last 15 years, there has been two important developments that aid our strategy in that. One is what people talked about around the question of BDS and the call for boycotts. Um, let's be clear, this is not just like some NGOs or a reformist call. If you look at the call for the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, it is a radical call. It is trade unions and civil rights organisations in Palestine saying that if you are a trade unionist in Britain or you're a student in Britain or an activist in Britain, you should boycott what Israel does because of all the cultural whitewashing that we see. But if you look at the call, they call for a one state solution. They say they want a de one democratic state where Palestinians and Jews have the same rights. What a... What a fantastically uh, brave thing to do. People who are being bombed in Gaza or under siege saying, actually, we don't want retribution. We don't, you know, this idea that, you know, one state's impossible because Palestinians could never live with Jews. The, the calls that came from the BDS movement says, look, we do want one state. We do think this can work. We don't blame every single individual within it. We think that one state can work, but it has to come from below. And the second thing that has shifted our political demands is what people talked about, about the social processes in the region. And this really, I think, is a fundamental thing, is in such a dire situation, in such an, a, a sharp political situation, what do you look to? Do you look to the negotiating tables of the UN? Do you look to the Palestinian Authority? Or do you look to the masses in the region? Do you look to the millions of working class people? Yes, in Gaza, yes, in Jerusalem, yes, in Hebron, but also in Cairo, also in Lebanon, 
also in Jordan. Those people have the power to transform and upset the whole apple cart in the region. And that's why what people talked about around Sudan, around Egypt and all the rest of it, that's why it matters. It offers us a vision of Palestinian liberation, but it offers us a vision of a different world entirely. A world in which ordinary people can seize their own destiny and aren't dictated by Washington, by uh, Jerusalem, or by the powers or the corridors of power in Westminster. And my final, final point then is that look, where you stand on Palestine is a litmus test. Ask someone where they stand on Palestine, and you will get a grasp of their total politics. If you compromise on Palestine, you will compromise on everything. Uh, if you're in the Labour Party and you say, yes, I support Palestine, but I won't mention it for fear of being excel expelled, then to be honest, you're not going to call for a £20 an hour minimum wage. You're not going to call for mass social housing. Uh, in the Socialist Workers' Party, we are 100% unashamedly committed to total Palestinian liberation. And our vision for that is liberation of ordinary people throughout the region. And we think that in Britain, our fight is their fight, and it's a fight against our own government. If you share that vision, you should think about joining us. Leave it there.